Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 29, Joy of Resistance, featuring Betty Lee. Betty Lee is a 70-year-old Asian-American activist who's been involved in the struggle for justice and equality for over 30 years. She is a substitute teacher at an alternative high school for mostly black and brown students. She currently resides and resists in Portland, Oregon. In the early 2000s, when I was doing street journalism in Portland, it seemed like I ran into Betty Lee at every protest, rally, and march I attended. I became a big fan of her photography at that time, when she used to post it on the Portland Indie Media website. She was definitely one of my favorite people in the activist scene there. So I was thrilled when, on July 31st, I saw an article published in Counterpunch under her byline, Tear Gas and Thugs at the Black Lives Matter protests in Portland. I tracked her down on social media and arranged this interview. It was a real pleasure to connect with her again. I think that your take on what's been happening in Portland this summer is really valuable, too. It's just that you've been around seeing things for a number of years there. So you have, you know, you can make some comparisons to to how this is compared to other, other times, you know? Yes. Yes, yes, I think I think I I think I have a few insights along those lines. Right. One story that I've heard about the protests in different places is that uh they've been pretty diverse and that the uh-huh. leaders the leadership it's has uh, especially has been diverse. Is that what you've been seeing in Portland? Well, I think that uh that's a real conscious effort on the part of uh Black Lives Matter protesters, especially the white protesters uh uh to to give uh the the black people the uh, positions of leadership and to allow black voices to be heard so yes uh i think you've heard uh you might have heard from the beginning there was a, a group called uh rose city justice okay have you heard of that group no actually i haven't heard of them Okay, so right from the start, uh, after uh, the murder of George Floyd, uh, uh, there was a group created in uh, Portland called Rose City Justice, and it was uh, organized and run by uh, young black people. And what they did was they organized nightly uh, marches uh, in Portland, uh, most of the time they would march across bridges, you know, like the Hawthorne Bridge, the Burnside Bridge, and so on, uh, to downtown. And uh, these marches were, were very uh, uh, well attended. I mean, thousands of protesters went on these marches. And uh, during one of these marches, they also uh, went down, marched down a, a major highway. I think it was I... 84 something like that Uh so you know and so the but mainly it was a a non-violent peaceful marches uh and like i said that was led by black people but uh uh i went on one of those marches uh because you know that was sort of right you know i was afraid of getting infected uh, by the virus and i knew that Thousands of people were uh, attending these marches, um, but unfortunately, um, starting about a month ago, there were charges brought up against this group, um, saying that they were uh, excluding other uh, people of color, other Black folks, you know, whose uh, beliefs or or strategies did not uh, did not. Uh, meet their their expectations or whatever, and they were also charged of not being accountable for things such as you know the financial uh, contributions that they had gotten 
which uh, amounted to thousands of dollars. And I guess the implication was that um, these funds were being misused for, uh, by the uh, organizers, you know. And so, so um, they've, they've stopped organizing any marches for almost a month now. And uh, so the whole focus of the Portland protest, the Black Lives Matter protest, uh, that it's shifted to the uh, Injustice Center uh, and, and the federal courthouse in uh, downtown Portland. Right. And that's where you went the night you went, because I think you went right. actually the same night that Ted Wheeler got, got um, tear gassed, right? No, actually, he got... Uh, uh, tear gas a couple of nights before. Oh, okay. So I went there uh, like a couple of days after he did. Right, and so you got to see. Well, I don't mean got to see, but you you were you were um, you were witness to the situation where instead of just being the Portland police, who are certainly bad enough, there's also these mysterious officers from the federal government who were there. Right, they were sent by uh, President Trump under uh, under what's what was called Operation Diligent Valor, and uh, Trump uh, claimed that he sent the federal troops to Portland because uh, the mayor of Portland had lost control of of the city and that the the city was you know in the grip of violent anarchists, quote unquote. And uh, so um, that's how he justified sending the federal troops uh, to Portland. But as you know, the the federal thugs, as I call them, they just uh, made the situation worse. They escalated the violence. And as you might have heard, you know, they were uh, snatching protesters on their way home, uh, just off the streets, uh, putting them in unmarked uh, vans and uh, detaining them for hours uh, uh, without charging them of any crime. So that really uh, created a backlash and a huge uproar. Right, and that's what you went and joined. Right, and uh, that's when I decided that, you know, I just couldn't stay home anymore and because it had become uh, much more than just about racial justice and racial equality and now it's about our first amendment rights to protest and our civil rights you know and of course you know the resistance i i want to support the resistance as i have been doing for over 30 years and uh, i i had actually gone to the the big protests at the injustice center twice uh, I was there two weeks or one week prior to July 25th, and that was the first night that the Wall of Moms appeared. Oh wow! Mm-hmm. So it was it was you know uh, a, a a good a good uh, time for me to go there and uh, uh, to witness the Wall of Moms presence and also to document you know their their. Uh, their efforts to protect the protesters and joining the protests. Right. And so what was that setup like? The, they, did they actually uh, literally just sort of stand between the protesters and the federal officers? Well, what happened is, uh, I, I don't know if you've seen a lot of photos and video Some. clips. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a, it's the, the, the main action is right in front of the federal courthouse not the injustice center and the the corporate uh the i'm sorry the courthouse had been uh covered with graffiti and uh i think some some of the doors or windows might have been smashed and so uh the place was just covered up with wooden boards and there was a tiny sort of opening a door where the police and the feds would rush out you know to to attack us and then uh, in the beginning, and I wasn't there in the beginning, but um, the the uh, police had, uh, there was no fence separating, you know, the boarded up courthouse and the demonstrators, the protesters. So um, after several 
um, shall we say, struggles, uh, the cops erected this metal fence to, quote unquote, protect the courthouse from the protesters. So the, when the wall of moms appeared, they stood directly in front of that fence. So knowing that when the, the feds and the cops charged out of the building, they would have to, you know, uh, they would have to encounter the wall of moms. But, you know, of course they attacked the moms with tear gas and pepper spray, so that wall did not hold <laughs> right. for very long. I mean, you know, when they started attacking us with pepper spray and tear gas and all those other weapons, everybody just starts running. Right, right. And it seems like they were basically targeting anyone and everyone indiscriminately is what I've heard from the story. So also That's right. legal observers, medics and uh, media journalists. Even corporate journalists, like you know, from the Oregonian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you seen? Was there any difference um, uh, in did, did did the corporate media, the local corporate media coverage, change at all at any point during this? Because I, I mean, my memory of corporate media in Portland is that they were usually pretty anti-protester. You know. Yes, you're right. And that's my opinion of them, too. That's why, in a way, you know, of course, I don't I don't support, you know, anyone getting injured by the police. But in a way, I was I I, I thought that it was a good experience for the corporate journalists, especially from the Oregonian and New York Times and wherever they came from uh, to experience uh police brutality themselves so because it validates what we've been saying for years you know so and and for years the the corporate media for the most part have uh downplayed the violence against protesters or question you know that somehow we were lying or exaggerating uh what we were experiencing but now that they're victims of the same police violence now, you know, they've come to realize that we were telling the truth all along. So I think in a way it's it's a good development. Right. And and uh like and as you mentioned in the beginning, the the coverage uh was quite positive and supportive of the Black Lives Matter protesters. And I think a big reason was because the corporate media were also victimized by the police attacks and violence. But uh, that seems to be changing. Uh, I was listening to the local news, you know, Channel 8, mm -hmm. uh, KGW yesterday. Uh -huh. And that's the show by this guy called Dan, you know, something, this is Dan or whatever. It's like a half hour show. And he he claims that uh, uh, last night uh, two hundred about two hundred protesters you know uh, uh, tried to set fire to the east precinct uh, to the, the police precinct uh, in the, the east police precinct and uh, so he really condemned it and said you know this is no longer about black lives matter this is a crime this is arson you know these people could have killed there were some employees uh uh in the building and he claimed that these people could have been killed so he came down hard on uh the protesters these 200 protesters uh last night and then after he spoke, uh, there was another segment uh, where Ted Wheeler uh, said he, uh, was shown uh, condemning the, pro the what happened as well, and saying that he's you know going to put a stop to all this violence and criminal activity. And then after that, uh, the uh, uh, several black people uh, appeared on TV. Uh, saying that the number of gun shootings in Portland uh, in the month of July last month had increased greatly, and they were calling for you know police um, uh, intervention, you know, to stop 
all this gun violence. Uh, uh, a lot of the gun violence was also uh, against black people. So this is black people calling for the police to help them stop gun violence against black people. And then, uh, so all this was going on. And then to top it off, uh, Channel 8 also included a segment uh, where they interviewed two police officers who had been present at these protests uh, for for several, you know, for a lengthy period of time. And uh, they were saying how horrified and terrified they were, you know, at the amount of hatred that they felt um, uh, coming from the protesters. And one of the police officers was a woman, and she looked quite, you know, she had blonde hair and blue eyes. And she said, you know, I shouldn't have to say this, but I'm actually half black, you know. And so she said she supported Black Lives Matter, but she did not support these violent attacks on the police, you know. And she said that sex, sexist and and uh, nasty comments were thrown at her, you know, that some of the protesters uh, accused her of being a, you know, a sex object for the the white police officers and just, you know, really nasty uh, accusations like that. So if if you see all, if you put all those parts together, it seems like they're, the tide is turning and now they're casting the protest, the Black Lives Matter protest, in a much in a negative light. Right. So, kind of back to business as usual in a way. Right. Yeah. And uh, you know, and the, the, this this is their answer to the demands of the Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter movement to defund the police, to hold the police accountable, and and in some cities even to abolish the police. Right. And of course, in, in the that coverage that you just described there, there wasn't uh, any substantive response to anything that the protesters have been asking for this whole time. Nope. Yep. Nope. It's just to make them look bad. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, they didn't they didn't uh, uh, they didn't feature. Uh, I mean, they didn't include any of the protesters to a to answer some of these charges and claims coming you know, from the police, the mayor, and uh, black, the black people in the community. So, you know, it was a, a pretty one-sided account. In a state of shock after the war, we interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. -L -L and now, back to our regularly scheduled... Right. So I, I've been a little confused reading different stories on trying to figure out um, have the feds left or have they not left? Well, from what I know, um, they are no longer uh, hiding out in the <laughs> in the federal courthouse. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been replaced by the state troops. Okay, but they are still in Portland and you know and uh, elsewhere. Uh, but they're they're now uh, guarding different federal buildings. Okay, so because the so they're still here, but they're just not in the courthouse. Right, right. Okay, so so because you know this really, there was the greater issue, of course, behind all of this of you know that the federal government has no place in policing local matters, and so it feels like that hasn't quite been a clear victory or a defeat. Well, that's how I see it, but you mm -hmm. know, of course, the the democratic uh, the, the uh, democratic pol politicians in the in the in the in Portland and in Oregon are claiming it as a victory. Okay. You know, I mean, I guess the larger picture is that the Democrats 
have used this as an anti-Trump, uh, uh, you know, um, public relations, or it's it, they they they're using it as 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 a way to uh, to criticize uh, Trump again. You right, know, so. rather than actually look at the at the the policies behind it, because of course the um, policies or the the that that led to being able to even send federal people to local places. Well, those powers go back to previous presidents, including uh, Obama. That's right. Yes, yes, that's very true. Yeah, and also, you know, um, as you pointed out, you know, the Portland police have a long history of uh, using violence against uh, nonviolent protesters. I mean, you know, we've we've seen them in action at so many protests. You know, anti-war, anti-racism, anti you know uh, immigration raids. Um, Mayday. And, uh, Mm -hmm. And May Day, exactly. May Day are at the WTO protests and, and so on. Although that was, you know, that's sort of widening the the, the geography, no longer Portland, but yeah, but that was in Seattle. And also um, the uh, the protests at the, at the federal courthouse had been going on for uh, 60 days and more. And uh, for the for the first sixty days or so, sixty nights actually. Well, wait a minute. Let me backtrack. For the for the first thirty nights, it was the Portland police, uh, under the orders of the mayor Ted Wheeler, who had been attacking the nonviolent protesters with tear gas and pepper spray and uh, projectiles and you know flash grenades and. Uh, and rubber bullets and uh, so when Ted Wheeler uh, appeared in July in late July to condemn the 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 uh, federal thugs being there a lot of the protesters booed him and uh, they called for uh, for him to be tear gassed you know they were shouting tear gas Ted tear gas Ted hmm. and uh, sure enough I guess uh, you know, he got a, a big dose of his own medicine later on. And when the night that you were there, uh, night 59, uh, I remember reading in your account in Counterpunch that you actually uh, did experience some tear gas yourself there. Yeah, oh, yeah. 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 And so that, um, you know, I'm sure thousands of other protesters uh, experienced it too because you know they really use uh, massive amounts of tear gas. You know it wasn't just a little a little canister here and there. I mean they were just kept shooting tear gas canisters at us and they kept chasing us. You know further and further downtown. So um, yeah, it was copious amounts of tear gas. And you got helped out by some medics there. Oh yeah, you know those. Street medics are really wonderful people. I mean, they're putting their lives on the line to help us out. So much love and respect for them. Oh, definitely. How would you like <laughs> compare what, what you've been seeing, what's been going on downtown this summer c compared to uh, previous years in Portland? Like, is, has it been different in some ways? Well, I think that... Uh, What's really uh, uh, surprising about the Black Lives Matter protests in Portland is the uh, longevity. You know, usually, you know, when during the anti-war protests or when Bush came to town or Cheney came to town or one of those, you know, those scum... <laughs> Can right. I cuss? <laughs> oh, you cuss all you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, when one of those scum fuckers came to town, you know, we go out and protest against them. And but that just lasted for that for that one day or for that one occasion. But with the Black Lives Matter protests, you know, especially the more radical, the more militant protests uh, in front of the uh, courthouse. That this has been going on for over sixty nights every day. You know, and um, every day these protesters have been attacked by the police and later by the police and the federal thugs 
with just copious amounts of tear gas and pepper spray and all those other nasty weapons, you know. And uh, it's it's a uh, it's it's really uh, very frightening because some people have be- gotten seriously injured. I mean, you you heard about this protester, 26 year old Donovan Labella. Mm-hmm. He was just standing across the street holding up a, a loudspeaker. And one of the federal thugs shot a pro- projectile that fractured his skull, and, uh, and and he had to undergo emergency surgery. You know, so and I and that been that so that's uh, that's a very serious injury, and so. I saw the photos. You know. That was really brutal. Right, right, and then there was uh, this footage of this. Uh, a uh, 54-year-old Navy vet who was just standing there, and he was just trying to talk to the to the cops or the feds, and they just beat him with their batons and they tear gassed him in the face. And then there was a, on July 27th, I was there with my good friend uh, Mike Hasty, who's a Vietnam veteran, and he's six, uh, 75 years old, and he was a medic in Vietnam. And he was trying to tell the federal thugs what he saw uh, in Vietnam. And his, you know, he said to them, this is one of the most important things that, that I'm going to tell you. And that is that the United States military uh, committed atrocities against the Vietnamese people every day, you know, during the American War in Vietnam. And for that, one of the thugs pepper sprayed him full blast in the face. And I wasn't there when it happened, but luckily other people were, and someone uh, recorded it on a on the on his uh, cell phone or whatever. And so that's been um, disseminated uh, everywhere. So Mike's become somewhat of a celebrity, and he's been interviewed by local and national media, and it's been written up in the the Common Dreams website, and so on. So even the Oregonian ran a interview with him. <laughs> oh wow, that's impressive. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I mean, that's uh, that's pretty nasty stuff, you know. Yeah, it really Just is getting pepper spray, you know, for just trying to talk to these, you know, the the the, the, the law enforcement. Yeah. I, I, I personally have been encouraged to see all these activities all over the whole country uh, this summer. And then, you know, especially to see the resistance against the feds in Portland. Yes. And And so I would ask you, dare we hope that this could turn into something bigger? I certainly hope so. I mean, you know, I'm going to put my hope <laughs> right there. <laughs> yeah, I hope that the I hope that the resistance is growing, and you know, especially with the influx of the of of the uh, ordinary people like the soccer moms and the dads and uh, uh, union workers and teachers and uh, doctors, nurses, you know, healthcare providers. Uh, it's it's really grown. Uh, uh, the resistance has really grown. It's not just you know the usual suspects uh, going to these protests. And um, I've read some interviews with some of the newcomers, like the moms, for example. I mean, they're just you know middle class or upper middle class uh, uh, soccer moms, and some of them uh, said that they've never been to a protest before. Wow. You know, so hopefully they're spreading the word and um, and I hopefully it's it, it's it's going to grow. And I also think that, the you know, that the the the, uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic, you know, has has uh, has has caused so many social economic uh, crises in in this country that we're going to see a lot of uh, social unrest as a result of that. You know, millions of people losing their jobs, 
Um, I read today that one third of the people interviewed in this poll say that they will not be able to pay their rent or their mortgages uh, in August. And um, with the unemployment checks uh, running out, uh, a lot of people are are going to be hurting really badly. And uh, I don't think they're just going to sit at home. You know, I think that, like I said, it's going to result in more social unrest and people taking to the streets. Right. Now, so uh, go now ahead. I don't know if that's going to feed into the Black Lives Matter movement, but it's certainly, you know, going to be it's going it's going to be another form of resistance against uh, the ruling elites and the people in power. Right. Certainly against Trump, you know. Right, right. I mean, and I don't think people. I don't think people are just going to sit home and wait till November, because they're going to be hurting right now. You know, so I mean, if they're getting evicted from their homes and they can't find a job, and they're you know they see their friends or their families getting sick with the coronavirus, you know, they want relief right now. They're not going to wait till November to vote Trump out. Right. Well, and and, you know, it's it's not very inspirational. You know, the opposition to Trump, Biden is not really promising a remedy for for anything, really. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's like Ralph Nader said, Tweedledee and Tweedledum or the lesser of the two evils. You know, we still get evil. So, no. We're, we're really fucked. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really tragic, you know. I mean, I mean it's, it's, uh, maybe it's, it's, it's a tragic scene that runs throughout U.S. history. You know, when, when we really think about it, how many of American presidents have been exemplary men of, you know, uh, great character, you know. I mean, I... How many? How many can you count? You know, how many do you consider? I mean, most of them are just horrible people. You know. Yes. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's 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 and and then when you think about the people who are in the positions of power in government and in corporate America, you know, you it's it's always the scum that rises to the top. You know, and uh, and. It's and, and their their greed and their corruption, you know, uh, is, is, has really destroyed this country and destroyed the lives of so many of of the people, you know, including some of our lives, you know. And uh, I mean, I used to think that that these people were just greedy and they were just corrupt, you know. But n more and more as I get older. I think that the sociopaths, uh -huh. you know, it's, it's, it's more than just greed and corruption, you know. I think they have a deep, deep hatred, you know, towards their fellow human beings. And they just don't give a shit about us, you know. Uh, they can just write policies and make decisions and take action that, that can destroy, you know, countries and uh, millions of lives, you know, without losing one night's sleep. You know what I mean? Yes. So, and I don't know how we're going to get rid of them uh, without, you know, without really uh, getting rid of the system as we know it and replacing it with something that's much more humane and just and so on. Right. I mean, it perhaps, you know, looking over history, um, it has taken a crisis before in order for big change to happen. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a revolution for sure. Yeah. Well, maybe we're getting there. I guess we're, you know, in the end, we're optimists because <laughs> we're, we're hoping that we'll see one during our lifetime. <laughs> oh, I, I, I hope so. I, I hope that's that that's what we're seeing now. I hope that you know, they look back and 2020 was the year it started. You know, that'd be great. Yes. You know, that's a great uh, uh, graffiti on the walls of the federal courthouse. You know, it's covered with graffiti. A lot of it is, you know, 
fuck the pigs and all that, but there are also some that are very quite profound and, you know, even poetic. And one of them was someone had written 2020, the year we started to fight back. Nice. Yeah. Yep. That's great. Yeah. And then there was another one that said, fuck you if you don't know what you're fighting for. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was pretty insightful too. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's great. I mean, yeah. Well, it's been about a half an hour. You said that's how long you wanted to, to give me. So if, if there's anything else you want to, to, to end with here, that, you know, here's your, that slot. Yeah, well, um, you know, I think that the the Black Lives move uh, the Black Lives uh, movement, you know, is 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 a great uh, wake up call, and uh, that uh, it's ripped open, you know, the the the, the uh, it's ripped open the the scars that's been caused by racism and and inequality in this country for 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 over 250 years and that uh, you know finally uh, more and more Americans are are waking up and they're listening uh to the stories of black and brown people and people of color people who've been you know the victims of racism and social inequality in this country so um uh but I think it has to go beyond just issues of uh, racism, uh, racial uh, justice, and racial equality as important as these are, and I think you know that the, the uh, it's it's much larger than that, you know, uh, and it's more and that uh, you know we need to we need to fight the system, you know, it's 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 more than just racism; it's the system that created white supremacy. Is the system that's perpetuating it, and uh, it's it's the system that has the power, you know, to um, to determine who lives and who dies, you know, and whose lives are valuable and whose lives aren't, you know. So if we really want justice and equality, you know, we have to fight the system. Awesome, yeah. I totally yeah. agree. I, you know, I really appreciate your photography, and I think a lot of people listening would appreciate it too. And uh, so, where can people go online to find your work and, and check it out? Oh well, I'm on Flickr. They can uh, they can type in the uh, joy of resistance. You know, Flickr. Uh huh. I I think it's www dot flickr dot com slash photos slash Joy of resistance. Joy of resistance. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, joy of resistance. Right. Yeah. And they, you know, if they want to, they can always email me, Lee Betty at gmail dot com. Betty's spelled with an E, so it's B E T T E. And as I like to joke, I just need an R to make me better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll uh, I'll put that in the in the show notes so people can find that. All right, okay, cool. Well, you take care and please say hi to Diva and I will. The good old days, but uh, I think maybe uh, we're in for uh, you know some serious uh, protests and hopefully some real social change. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast, and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.